Bé, bona tarda, doncs, benvinguts. Ens fa molta il·lusió de poder tenir aquí entre nosaltres el professor i investigador Jens Wigert, que ens parlarà del tema del Premi Nobel d'aquest últim any. I, bé, parlarà d'atociència, què és i què en podem fer. Per presentar-lo amb ell, bé, diré algunes coses. Si alguns heu entrat a la seva pàgina web, ja heu vist que se'n poden dir moltes coses dels seus mèrits, que en té moltíssims, jo en diré molt poques coses. Doncs, per començar, va fer la tesi a la Universitat Tècnica de Múnic el 2001 i de seguida va ser contractat com a investigador a l'ETH de Zúric i després com a professor assistent en el mateix lloc, després d'obtenir l'habilitació entre el 2003 i el 2006. El 2007 ja va ser professor d'ICREA i va crear el grup de recerca d'atociència i òptica ultraràpida de l'ICFO, que és el lloc on està ara. I també és professor adjunt de la Universitat de New Mexico dels Estats Units des del 2012 i guest professor, o sigui, convidat al Fritz Haber Institut del Max Planck de Berlín des del 2019. És editor d'Òptica en Ultrafast Science i també del llibre blanc Streamlight Infrastructure. Ha tingut nombrosos premis, des del 2001 una Marie Curie, el 2004 un premi Allen de l'Optical Society dels Estats Units, el 2011 un premi de Xina, que es podria dir 1000 talents, 1000 Talents Program Hour, diu aquí, el 2018 també diferents premis de l'European Research Council, i el 2019 el Premi Bessel de la Fundació Fon Humbel. També ha organitzat moltíssimes conferències i mítings. Jo n'he comptat unes 16, parlaré només de les properes. El 2024 a Barcelona, Ultrafast Fenomena Conference. També el 2024 una conferència a Estransburg, Advances in Ultrafast Condensed Fase Physics Conference i l'any que ve, el 2025, a Múnich, la Cleo, d'Europea. És i ha sigut avaluador de nombrosos consells de direcció de diferents llocs i de diferents universitats d'Europa, d'Estats Units, de Canadà, de Rússia i de Xile. Ha sigut director executiu del Laser Lab Europe, un una estructura amb 46 infraestructures i 22 països diferents implicats. I també de la Comissió de Recerca, de Recerca en Infraestructures de la Comunitat Europea, que també implica uns 40.000 investigadors. Té unes 570 publicacions i un índex H de 54. Ha escrit 3 llibres i 10 capítols de llibres. Té una patent i dues altres en tràmit. Però a mi el que m'ha impactat més, he de reconèixer, i que penso que val la pena dir-ho, és que dels seus exestudiants i exalumnes n'hi ha 15 que ja estudien que ja són professors en una situació estable i crec que això mereix una gran felicitació. Bé, doncs li deixo la paraula que ens expliqui aquest tema tan interessant. Núria, thank you very much for the very long introduction. I feel honored. Also, I'd like to thank Jose and Krina for probably suggesting that I talk here, right? Um, so the Nobel Prize um, 2023 was given for auto second science and the question is what, what is it really, right? What can be done with it? And I, so I tried not just to tell you historically or what I am doing, but I'll, I'll try to mix a little bit with hopefully something didactical, which is not too lengthy. It's not gonna be a lecture, but I wanna try to explain at least the excitement that I feel what can be done with that field, right? And so, 
Very good. <laughs> I hope you can all see it. So if you look at the website of the Nobel Prize, you will see this, right? These three people got it. And um, for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses for light for the study of electronic dynamics in metal. Yes, this means everything, and what, what does it really mean, right? So I'll try to explain a bit. And also, of course, it's clear that even though three people got this prize, many more people worked on that for it. Theorists, um, a lot of collaborations. And um, so I'll, I'll try to hopefully convey a little bit the excitement. And I want to start differently than in a normal talk. I would say I'd like to give you a motivation first. For example, why I do this, why I came here to Barcelona or to, to ICFO, and what can I give you three examples, okay? And you will see why I give you that in a second. So what are the big problems? Some big problems that many people work at, on, and that also touch some of our societal problems. There are many more. This is light harvesting. So you know that many people work on organic solar cells, and um, the, the reason is obvious. They are cheap to make. Right? You can harvest light. It would be good to get energy from sunlight, especially here in, in the south of Europe. What are some of the problems? Well, the problems are that the efficiency is not very high, maybe 17%, maybe 18%. And then you can ask yourself, what do we have to do to make it better? And of course, many people work on that. Um, but we still don't know what to do better. So if you then ask from a fundamental point of view, what can be the issue? Well, one of the issues can be that, I don't know if you can all see this, but basically, is the sunlight absorbed efficiently? That's one simple question that you can ask, right? So this has to do with the material, with uh, dipole moments, with, uh, I, I mix a little bit some physics terms and I try to be more general on some models. And then the other one is you generate um, an electron hole pair. You basically separate charges in the material by absorption of sunlight. And then you want that these charges move to some electrodes so you can save them in some batteries or store them somehow. And it could be that this transport doesn't really work efficiently. And if you look at all the methods that people are using, still we haven't solved this. I'm not saying I'm solving it. But I'm trying to explain to you what some of the problems can be here, right? And I believe that attosecond science can provide a very powerful new tool to look at such things. And you'll see in a few minutes. I'll give you another example. Chemical functionalization is everywhere. Chemical industry is everywhere. In your clothes and everything. If you would take it away, we would run around naked. We would, we would have a lot of issues. Medication would be missing. Pharmaceutical industry all depends on it. Simplest case, you have, let's say, different benzene rings. So this is carbon rings, molecules that are rings of carbon atoms. And for example, Dell, Dow Chemical works in it, right? Polymerization for all the plastics. You need to open this ring and dock it to a next one. You need to make chains of this to build fibers and to build uh, substances. And this is done by trial and error on a very high level, but you basically just change some chemicals, some catalyzers, you change temperature, pressure. But from a fundamental point of view, it would be nice if we could, one of the oldest dreams in chemistry is how to steal these chemical reactions, right? So you would really like to have a microscopic view into how this works. I'll give you a last one. This is, if you can't read it, I tell you anyways. So for example, internet <coughs> devices, your computers, information transfer is based on electronic circuits. In these electronic circuits, you move charges, electrons. They scatter with each other. There is loss. There is coupling to the material, to the lattice. This is heat. That's loss. And in fact, currently, about 10-12% um, of the global energy budget goes into that. And a lot is lost in heat. And the prediction, uh, conservative prediction until 2030, is that it doubles nearly. So it goes to 20%. But we should actually save energy, right? So that's just one, one other big problem. So of course, a lot of people here and everywhere else work on material science, uh, 2D materials, try, try to overcome some of these issues. But again, we don't have a solution yet. 
And the question is, can we wait until we solve this by accident, or can we try maybe with other experimental techniques to, to push this uh, kind of problem? So the question is, I gave you three different examples. What con now let's see what connects all of this. Well, this is a, a picture, basically, of atoms, like from a scanning electron microscope. You, you can get this. And you see there is a certain landscape. So this is like a layer of atoms in a material. And I just superimposed, for example, what they are. Maybe there are two species of, of, of atoms that people play with. And if I further zoom in, in one atom, this is the simple picture that you learn in, in science class. Right? It's not that simple. Um, and you really don't see it that easily. We imagine each of these atoms as a positive charge, a proton. Right, let's say in an electron. And maybe like, in, a, like in, a, in an orbit, this electron moves around, but we know by now through quantum mechanics, this is not really how it is. It's more like a cloud, a distribution, a probability to find this electron, this negative charge, somewhere in that vicinity. Think, the f think again about the solar cell. If now a photon, some light comes in, you excite these atoms, you put energy in it, and actually it grows, right? The electron moves on a different radius, classically speaking. And these differences is, for example, what controls, on a, on a very simplified way, this kind of interaction, light matter interaction. And in fact, the exact arrangement of this is really important. It's not that simple. Actually, I have a very nice animation here that I stole from the internet. And you can see this is in Bohmian uh, mechanics. It's trying to show this probability with these little dots, right? And you see there is a huge variety. In fact, it's, it's very beautiful, <laughs> right, for us. And the exact arrangement and the exact changes is really what governs on a very, very fundamental level, on a microscopic quantum level, uh, such reaction. And then we, we say, okay, this is a wave function. It's basically a probability that I find this electron somewhere, right? Okay. Um, however, if I go back to what I said to you with the internet devices, right, and I said a lot of energy is lost in a very simple way, you can imagine you have this, this atomic potential, right, so basically the electron moves across it in a simple picture, but you see you have all these little, all these little dips and it might slow down also. Now, if you add heat to it or vibrations of a lattice, right, you can imagine it becomes more difficult or maybe even easier under some circumstances. So what I'm trying to say in a few simple words is that it is important from a conceptual point of view that you don't only see the red thing, right, the atoms, or you see only the blue thing, which is the charges, the electrons, you see it together because they interact. And most of the times when we have such problems that we want to address, like what I gave at the beginning, we have to look at this together. And many of the methods that people have in physics actually struggle to look at this together or under different conditions. What I'm trying to convince you of a little bit is that auto second science now provides a way to look at this together at the same time, at ultra fast time scales, and without missing this interaction. And this is why it's so powerful. So my argument here is, and I say this when I give other talks also, is that if you want to address these problems, wouldn't it be nice if we had a microscopic view into what makes these things work? First, then we can hope to understand it, work together with theory, and then maybe have an engineering approach, right? We would know maybe which material to connect with which other material, how to change its properties. And it's a very difficult problem, but it's conceptually possible if you have this, this view. In physics language, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, you know that in a material you have electrons or holes. These are these orbitals, these electron wave functions that I show here. But of course, they are coupled. If, a, if, if, if atoms move, if a lattice moves, it changes the electronic states. It changes the position of these electrons and vice versa. We cannot see this as independent in most of the interesting cases. And that's, of course, many-body physics, as we call it in physics. It's one of the hardest problems, right, that we can try to solve, but one of the most important ones, because I think the motivation is, is clear. So I stole this movie from Ferenc Krauss, 
uh, one of my old collaborators, so he's one of the Nobel Prize winners. They, the Max Planck has a lot of people, they make wonderful <laughs> animations. That's one of them. And what I show you is what are the time scales? Because I told you now there is these electrons, there is atoms, there are these problems or challenges. So what are we talking about? Which time scales and what do we really need? <coughs> why Atto, right? Atto means 10 to the minus 18, but why that time scale? So what they try to make in this animation is they show a zoom into a material or some molecules here. And okay, sorry, it's in German. It means basically slowing down time by a certain factor, right? right? And it tells you what it is. So this is about electron transfer. So let's start. On the second scale, right, you have the beating of your heart, right? And you see the, the slowdown factor of time is here. If you go now a factor 1,000 slower, you could see actually the beating of the wings of, for example, a fly. So I just, it takes a little bit, but I think it's a very nice animation to show you the, the scales that we have to get to. If you go even further, right, a million times, or a fraction, a millionth of a second, maybe we can imagine this. I cannot really. But any numbers below that, you, we, we don't really have a feeling for it, right, how short this is. You see, if you go to the nanosecond scale, that's a billion times, you can start seeing electronic charges in circuits, in electronic circuits, right? Actually, this is something that we are manipulating with this attosecond technology in light. If you go to 10 to the minus 12 picoseconds, you can see rotations, for example, of molecules. This is what's done all the time. Femtoseconds, also the Nobel Prize was given to Seville for that some long time ago, is to see vibrations of molecules. And now if we add another factor 1,000, we can start seeing this electronic motion. And why is it important? Because I told you before, you need to see the electronic motion together with the vibrations, together with the atomic motions. Otherwise, you're missing something. So if you're missing something, it's like this picture, right? You're seeing the cars that are static, more or less. This is like if you had a camera to film where is my electron in a simple sense. And if your camera is too slow or the illumination of the scene is too slow, you will see just a blurry image. You know there was a car. You even know there were three or four or five, but you don't know, was it a car? Was it two motorbikes? What car was it? Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is what the interaction really was, how it really worked. So it's not just the time resolution, but the time resolution is really important. And we do this in physics all the time or in science. Actually, it goes back to um, Muybridge on a bed, um, but essentially it's called flash photography. It's a bit like in a discotheque, the strobe light, right? So your camera is always recording, but the room is dark. Then you just have a, a short flash of light with which you illuminate it, you make an exposure on the image, you have one snapshot. And if this flash of light is fast enough, you can take pictures like this. And you see here, the first flash photography here was really like on a microsecond time scale, right? One millionth of a second. Atto second is actually a lot less. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of this, so this is the time scale of electrons. Um, light travels to the moon in about one second. Okay, around the globe in 140 milliseconds and across an atom in around an attosecond. So I can still not imagine it. <laughs> and in fact, we measure it in my lab all the time, but these are really short time scales. So again, the concept of this pump probe measurements, maybe you have seen this in some physics class, we like to show this typically in experimental physics one or so, is you have a fan that moves fast, right? and you have a strobe light that is so fast that you essentially nearly don't see it here. And if you do this right and you synchronize it, so the fan, let's say, moves at 600 revolutions per minute, and if your light is fast enough to capture it, it looks like the motion is frozen. And that allows us to actually look at these fast motions. And these other second pulses are nothing else than that. So in chemistry, we take these snapshots of a reaction, for example, and we change a bit the time delay. You see this in the picture that persists here, right? You see it rotates a little bit. So that means there is an assumption here. The assumption is that this is reproducible. 
I can do this a million times the same way. And each time I take the picture a little differently and then I piece together my image. And that's in fact what's done nearly everywhere uh, to, to look at dynamics. But there are some limits here. There are some fundamental limits. And the fundamental limit is basically that light has to propagate. So let's say if you have a flash of light, it's electromagnetic radiation. This is symbolized by this electric field that oscillates here on the, on the right. And the minimum that you can have is just one oscillation, right? But the oscillation has a certain wavelength, a certain color, right? The longer the wavelength, the farther this is apart. So one oscillation only, you see, depending on the color or the energy of the light, right? whether in the divisible, for example, you're somewhere a bit less than this, okay? Or you have, uh, you have the, uh, the long wavelengths, you have the soft x-rays, you have different wavelengths ranges. And of course, the electro it's all the same thing. It's electromagnetic radiation, but its color, its wavelengths, or its photon energies, it all says the same changes, right? And so this is the fundamental limit. That means, for example, if you go back to the history of laser physics, the first dye lasers that people made already in 1973, you, say, you see, had a picosecond duration. So you could take things with, uh, with a resolution of one picosecond and illuminate them. And already in 1988, actually my PhD advisor was that, or one of them, you see you're in the femtosecond regime. So already there they could do look at vibrations and this was the basis for femtochemistry. Then came a revolution in, in laser technology to make these flashes based on less annoying lasers because dye lasers, mainly they are toxic, they are dyes, they change, they evaporate. So they don't work the same in a week than they do now. And Thai sapphire or solid state lasers change this and you see the revolution in, in orange there. But still, you will never see anything below here because that's a fundamental limit of nature. In 2003, this was actually my group at ETH, we, we, we made this uh, short pulse. And then this was actually the basis, as you will see in a few minutes, to go to the Atos second regime. And now, uh, here we are here, this again, at here in 2017. Um, so that means that you have actually the short pulses to do these kind of investigations. So let me now tell you a little bit about the Nobel Prize because that's why you're really here, not because of me, right? But because I tried to introduce and connect this a little bit. So why was this prize given to these people? Well, what I tried to tell you is that in order to make these, you need short pulses of light and the short pulses depend on the color of light, on the wavelengths. And I told you on the previous slide, let me go back that if I now want to go to the upper second regime, right, and I have visible light, I cannot do it, right? Or if I want to go to the mid IR, I can't do it, right? My shortest pulse is here. But if I go to the X-ray or soft X-ray regime, that means I need shorter wavelengths, I need higher energy photons, I need some way to shift this wavelengths, then I can hope to make short pulses of light. So the prerequisite was really that we need to change somehow these wavelengths. And there is no laser that you can buy. There is nothing that gives wavelengths like that. So we need some kind of technique, some kind of mechanism, nonlinear optics mechanism, that gets us there. And this is what they actually saw by accident. <laughs> okay, sometimes things happen by accident, but it's not always bad. And so in, this is a picture of the laser Okay, it looks all a bit archaic, but uh, it worked well. And an experiment where actually they shine a laser on atoms, argon atoms, for example, and they wanted to see how these strong laser pulses interact with these atoms. And typically, if you remember what I, what I tried to tell you at the beginning, you absorb light, right? You make this radius larger, you excite the, the atom. At some point, it's tired of that. It will, it will actually collapse back and emit some light, fluorescence. And they were studying that, not just, so Anulier was doing that, is one of the Nobel laureates um, at CA in France, in Paris, in Saclay, but there were many others that were doing that. One person, for example, that didn't get the Nobel Prize is Charlie Rhodes in Chicago. They were also doing that. 
He's actually a um, PhD student of Teller, um, the one from the hydrogen bomb. Anyway, so they were, they were looking at these things. And you see, I show you here the two publications that they had at about the same time. Actually, the left one is from Chicago even a year earlier. And you see um, intensity, wavelengths. So this is color. So here, is, here, let's say, is the infrared, and here is the shorter wavelengths, the ones that we want to get to. And normally, you would expect that the efficiency drops rapidly. This is a logarithmic scale. So immediately, you have nothing left. But they saw this, what they call plateau. So for some magic reason, you have more, you have more photons than you expect. And this wasn't understood for a very long time. So this was a real hard nut to crack for theory. And there were many theory groups involved um, to solve this and to understand why is this happening. Um, I can tell you, but it will be longer than the time that you give me here. But this was, this was one, of the, one of the puzzles. And why is it interesting? Again, because I tell you they start with a laser shown on the left here. It's not on that scale, an infrared laser at one micron. And then they get to the blue here, the 30 third harmonic. This is very high, not just second third harmonic. It's, it's, an, ex, it's an extremely short wavelength. And they, again, I show you on the bottom here the, um, the electromagnet, electromagnetic spectrum. And you see the visible that our eye sees is just a tiny part of it. Right? You have radio waves, right? you have microwaves, you have infrared, you have UV, X-rays, or gamma rays. And so, actually, with that technique, by accident, they could now make very efficiently, unexpectedly efficiently, light at the shorter wavelengths. And then people were thinking, oh, wait, wait, if I now have this, I can make short pulses. I can make shorter pulses with it. But there are, there are quite a few questions because it's just light, right? It's not a laser. Your light bulb is not a laser. A laser is different. The light is very, very coherent, very directed, very uniform. And so there were lots of questions to be answered whether this is useful for anything, right? But it was just a curiosity at that time. So we call this harmonics. We had a discussion before about this. It's really a bit misleading because there's, it's not really harmonic. Let's say you just have frequency spikes, right? You have, wave, you have light emitted at different wavelengths through a process that was not understood at that time, but very high harmonics, 30 third of the frequency. And it's a bit similar if you, this is basically a violin, and the ones of us that teach physics or have taken a physics class, they probably love this as much as I do, so they are, it's called a Kladni plate. You can actually put some powder or some sugar or something on it, and depending on the frequency that, that you plug your violin at, you see different patterns here. The patterns is basically how the thing vibrates. And it changes completely depending on the frequency. And if you really get into this, into acoustics, you will understand, for example, a violin is not just one frequency. It's not just one tone, let's say, at 440 hertz. They are so-called overtones that really make the, the timbre. You know, they, they give the volume uh, to the sound that you hear. And it's, it's very similar, in fact. If you do a full calculation nowadays of the top process of this interaction with atoms, and you calculate the electronic density, this, this fancy animation that I showed you with all the little dots, right, how this looks like, this is how it looks like. So this is space. So here was an atom. This is the probability density, right, the wave function, if you will, in space. This is really space, like in one plane. And you see there is a pattern here. I'm not saying it's the same pattern. I'm just trying to make an analog that you plug your atom like a violin with your laser, and then you get actually some tones out. And these tones or overtones are these harmonics. That's what we understand now. Okay? And of course, by changing the medium, changing the atoms, or um, how you do this, you can change completely these patterns. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we have short pulses. I advertise to you that we need short pulses, right? If you study laser physics, there is a concept called mode locking. So let's say, what does it mean? In a laser, you have a cavity in, in which <coughs> resonates different wavelengths. For example, out of these overtones, you take the third, the fifth, 
They had up to 33, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on. If they are all connected correctly, they add up. We call this coherence or coherent superposition. So you see they all line up perfectly. And you can already see, if I just have two of them, I already, you can guess this is the electric field, right? It oscillates. You might have pulses here. Okay? They're not very short here, not very nice. But you get the concept. Now if we add more of them together, you can get much shorter pulses. And in fact, the one of the, one of the three, um, Pierre Agostini, so he's, he was also at CEA. They were working also on, on these kind of experiments. What he got the Nobel Prize for mainly is the investigation to prove with some different methods that these are individual pulses, that they are a train of pulses, not one pulse, a train, right? And this was very important because that meant that somehow there is a phase relation. This means that somehow these wavelengths, these kind of oscillations all add up. Somehow, that we wasn't understood at that time, but somehow, luckily, they add up. That meant that you can get really short pulses, which is really short means atto, right? Just, this I just simulated for you. If this doesn't happen and they're, they're randomly oriented, right? They don't line up, you see it's useless, it's a mess. It's basically noise. So this is very crucial that this is really happening in a very controlled way. Okay, I have to advertise a bit what I also did, right? So this was in, um, we did actually experiments at that time with Anulier together when I was at ETH. Um, you see some picture, this is, was my lab at ETH with my people. And we looked at the fact, can we control how they exactly line up? Right? Because that allows you to shape these pulses, to change the pulse duration and when they come and so on. And in fact, we could prove that this is possible. So the middle picture, this is actually on. So we, we were doing these experiments in December, just before Christmas. So we had a nice Christmas dinner there. And you see then uh, one of the first meetings. I think it's nice to see some of these old pictures also. Uh, this was basically in Ringberg. This is a castle of the Max Planck Society in the Bavarian Alps. And you see um, basically Ferenc Kraus here, Anelier. You see Paul Kalkum. He made a lot of contributions, especially in theory. He didn't get the Nobel Prize because only three people can get it. But um, he made nice contributions. I was a little young, younger than other people that have uh, really contributed uh, to, to this very much. Yeah, maybe I'll go here. Okay. Um, okay. So, I showed you that you can make spikes of pulses, many pulses. How can you make one? And this is actually what Ferenc Gauss uh, mainly got the Nobel Prize for. And I show you here a simulation that we have done. If you buy a laser, even if it's a very sophisticated one, it will not give you one oscillations. It will give you many oscillations, okay? And maybe 10 or 20 or 100 even. So what will happen is like this. What, what I show you here is basically, uh, we call this Fourier relation. This is, on the left is time, on the right is frequency or color or photon energy. It's the same thing. And they're connected by, by uncertainty relation, if you will, and you see the laser field, the electric field in red on the, on the top here. And each time when, when the laser field actually is zero, when, when it can recollide electrons, you can have a burst. And this burst, if you Fourier transform in frequency, you see these cones. These are these harmonics that I was telling you. This is how we can simulate this nowadays. If you only, if you restrict the duration of this to just one time, Okay, <coughs> then as you could see how the top spectrum was built up, you basically have a smooth curve. You have a smooth um, <coughs> curve if you have only one of these bursts in time. If you have many, they interfere and they give you this, this modulation that you see on top. So this is what they had seen until, until that time because the lasers that they had were not really short enough. The pulses were not short enough. So by driving this atomic interaction, they always got a spectrum which was many harmonics, right? Many overtones, but this meant not one pulse. But if you want to take a picture, 
and you have a strobe light or a camera, you don't want to deal different flashes all the time. You want one flash. You look at something, you take the picture, you do another flash when, when you want. So it was very important, but unfortunately to make such short pulses is far from trivial. And a lot of people were working on that. In fact, two Nobel Prizes um, are related to that. One in 2005 on frequency combs, which means to make these electric fields reproducible. And in 2018 on amplifying these pulses enough to do this interaction that now led to auto second science. So there are actually two <laughs> Nobel Prizes that will a prerequisite, you need to master these techniques in order to do anything in auto second science. This is um, from, from my group, and in ETH at that time, we made one of the shortest pulses, 3.8 femtoseconds, and if I look at the spectrum, this is the spectrum here, just shown vertically, you see, again, there are these modulations, and okay, for the connoisseurs here, or the ones that uh, study a bit nonlinear physics, what this shows is <coughs> quantum trajectories. So this is basically how the electron in an atom moves as function of the laser field as function of time. And you see again where it's smooth. This is where we want to have light because it means we can make one short pulse. So the problem was make a short pulse, amplify it, do the interaction, find a way to filter this out, and then find a way to measure it. This is why it took 15 to 20 years, right, to understand these things. And in fact, this was the very first measurement. Marcus was on this one picture. Um, it doesn't look like much, I know. It's disappointing you see this kind of noisy thing here with a little dip. But the little dip, the width of this dip, is actually the duration in time. And at that time, well, they didn't control it that well the duration was only 1.8 femtoseconds, 10 to minus 15. Super short, but not at all, not enough to do these kind of experiments. Then people quickly understood how to tweak the lasers better to control the interaction, and already a couple years later, three years later, they made this wonderful measurement. And this is, in fact, um, this is a proof that the auto second pulse was already 250 auto second. It was a single pulse, so this was a real breakthrough. Okay. How does an experiment like this look like? That's a picture from my lab, but if you go to the Max Planck in Munich, or you go to Sweden, or you go to Ottawa, or to other places, it looks similar. This radiation in the X-ray or X-UV regime doesn't propagate in air. You need, to put, you need to do everything in vacuum. So this is why you see these chambers here that makes things annoying, because you have to all align it in vacuum, you have to pump it down, then you have to do experiment. If something goes wrong, you have to vent it, you have to open it, you have to repeat. And it's expensive, right? So typically we have different parts. The laser I don't even show to you. It's actually basically like one third of this room at least at that time. And if you have this, you interact you, with, with atoms in there, you generate these harmonics. And then if you want to use them for something or measure at that time, you, you measure electrons, you, me you do electron spectroscopy, so you, you need ultra high vacuum. So that means you have to manage actually really high vacuum and all of this together. You cannot put windows in between or anything. It just has to be done dynamically. Anyways, it's beautiful physics, at least for me. This is a picture of the interaction of the laser with a gas target. So in here is a, little, is a little tube through which a hole is drilled by the laser itself. We bring in gas at high pressure, it streams out in opposite direction and the laser goes along with it. And you can see the glow, it's basically just fluorescent, so the atoms are excited and they emit light. And you can actually see the flow, the, the hydrodynamic flow of this high pressure gas into vacuum. It's actually interesting by itself. To scale this from the 30 fold harmonic to the 500s harmonic, which is what we have nowadays to get really short wavelengths, uh, took, took us at least five years. And so we made actually the first soft X-ray auto second pulses here in Barcelona with this. You also need optics that are difficult to get. For example, this is an elliptical mirror at these wavelengths, the optics are just at grazing incidence. You cannot use a lens or glass or something like that. 
And if you think about it, the wavelengths the, of this light is on the order of the atomic distances. So that means this mirror here, there actually, exist actually only two in this world. Um, and they don't make it anymore. You have to buy it from Japan. You can still get some. It took two years to make it. And they, uh, after polishing and measuring, they actually look at it and they see individual atoms, like in this first picture I showed you, you know, with this like egg cup structure. And they shoot individual atoms out to make it flat. So you have to be super careful with this. But it means you can take that radiation and focus it and do an experiment with it. And then, for example, here this was our first experiment on top. You see these harmonics, like what I showed you in these drawings and pictures. This is really what you measure, right? This was driven, therefore, with a long laser pulse. At that time, we didn't have such a short laser pulse. Then we made it much shorter, we changed, we did a lot of tricks. And you can see now the spectra, this is for two different wavelengths of the laser, are actually extremely broad. If you can reach the numbers, they go from 200 to 600 EV. This is a huge spectrum. It's a, we call this a super continuum, but it's a coherent spectrum. And this is super interesting for material science, for chemistry, and many applications. And if you measure the pulse, and we did, you get actually the shortest pulse that was ever generated is 23 attoseconds, and it's a single pulse at this photon energy. So that means you're in business, you can do experiments with it. So I want to advertise a little bit how we started here, and actually I'm proud of it, and especially of my people that have made this possible, right? This is not just me, this is a lot of people, as you have heard from the introduction. So we started with ICFO on the left. As you can see, this was my lab when I came here. Now it looks much prettier, like in the second picture here. And you see, we started with these people. We all looked a little younger. We do a lot of outreach also to show people what can be done with it, especially together with the master in photonics and the professors. If you take a fisheye view, that's how the lab looks like. So it's a special environment, very stable, and so on. You need all these things. but. We have it here, so you should be proud, actually, that, uh, that Catalonia and, um, you know, and Mas Collier and Luis Torne, who was the founding director and is still the director, made this possible here. And for me, it was attractive to come here, actually, to build such a thing. And you see, for the ones who like physics, it's fantastic because you see a lot of chambers, a lot of cables, a lot of stuff to play with. Um, but what I want to show you is this is really state of the art that we have here, right? Um, it's not small or anything, and we can do fantastic science with this. So, this is a picture of this atomic interaction. And over the years, we have found ways to scale this, as I said, even to the soft X-ray regime, where it's interesting for material science. This is just changing, pushing this much further. For that, we developed what is called mid-IR photonics, which is now a booming field, because you can do spectroscopy with it. There are standoff spectroscopy, biomedical spectroscopy, there are lots of other applications that have nothing to do with other science, but it comes out of the technology that had to be developed in order to push the other second field. We use this in different ways. I'm not going to talk about this here, but we use the process of this other second generation not only to make light, but when the light interacts, the light is just a consequence of the interaction, if you will. So you can imagine that the light is a fingerprint of the interaction itself. So at the beginning, we just used the interaction to make the light, right? these auto second pulses. But over the years, we learned how to analyze this light to learn about the interaction itself. Right? It goes both ways. And in fact, we're at a, I don't know if you can see this, but we're at a point where we can use single molecules, uh, an isolated single molecule, not sitting somewhere, just in ultra high vacuum, we can take one of its own electrons and we, we measure the structure. That means where is each atom in a big molecule as a function of space and time. So it's really the movie I was trying to advertise to you. And we can see this, not for biological big you know, DNA, but we can see it for quite big, even chiral molecules. And this is exciting because you can finally see what your textbook is trying to tell you, but nobody has really seen. And the dynamics of it. And we can apply this to mater material science. So I just show you on top a few pictures of people that have contributed to one part of this investigation. 
And again, here you see the, you, I don't know if that works. Yeah, you see the image again of, of the interaction. This is just sketched here. And what we then do is, after characterizing this radiation, for example, we put a sample in here that we want to measure. And we measure in transmission. We send the light through it. And if you remember still on my very first slide or second slide, I said when light gets absorbed, you, you excite the material. So that means that when light is missing or not missing, it's actually like a fingerprint of the atomic or electronic structure of these materials directly. And it's the ultimate fingerprint on a microscopic scale. Typically, you have to go to user facilities. For example, you can go to ALBA, and we have nice collaborations with them. But you will not have the time resolution, and you will not have all these wavelengths together. You will have very narrow wavelengths range that you have to scan. So the, this is one of the issues, because if you want to understand how these materials work, how they respond, how sensors work, this is not static. It's dynamic. right? And for dynamics, you need, again, auto or femtosecond time resolution. So what can we do with it? These are two of our recent measurements. So for example, the top one is one of these materials that people now use a lot for material science, boron nitride, right? And monolayer boron nitride. Um, or for example, on the bottom, titanium uh, disulfide. Never mind what it is exactly, but these are materials that are interesting for material science for different applications. And you see, you see for example, on top B and N, so these are really the atomic constituents of the material itself. And you see there, are stru <coughs> there is structure on top of it, these. And without going too much into detail, you see pi star, sigma star. These peaks are like a fingerprint of the electronic structure of each material. This means like where do these electrons sit, these radii, or this, this kind of complicated things in the animation I showed you. This is where we see them directly. And we see them directly on all the parts of that material. Why is this important? Because now if I want to look at, for example, a transistor, or I want to look at an electronic circuit, or at a material or something where I move charge or, or an excitation from one part to the other part, from one constituent to the other, I want to see when this happens and where it happens. Remember, I told you these, these things are not efficient. So I want to see if an excitation, for example, reduces one, one of the peaks here, that means that um, my absorption is less, that means I have one, one electron more, let's say, it must have come from somewhere. So I should see at the same time that the nitrogen changes differently, right? So I can see where the things go. If I have lattice motion, for example, heat, and I lose this energy, I see that because it doesn't correspond to each other anymore. So this is one way to dig into the details on a microscopic scale of these materials. I give you, don't worry, I'm, I'm nearly done, but I, I want to give you another example here, which is furan. You remember I told you about polymerization, these different carbon uh, molecules that you have to put together. Furan, these are carbon atoms, the black stuff are carbon atoms, and the, white one is an, uh, the, the red one is an oxygen, the white one are hydrogens. This is one standard molecule, an aromatic molecule that you want to have. And one of these questions then come, how does, if I want to put two together, how does it open? How can I open it? Can I open it more efficiently? What do I have to do? It's actually a more complex question because, for example, even in your body or in DNA or in some processes, it's in order for a molecule, for example, to dock here, it, it has to open, it has to be able to accept the other molecule, for example, in a chemical reaction. And so you need to see the structure, you need to see how this moves and what you can do. So I know this is complicated, but that's uh, what you show in chemistry, for example. So what you can have is the molecule <coughs> as, it, as it is, and then, for example, there are two possibilities. One is it's open and one it's not open. <laughs> it's very simple, right? If I put energy into it, it doesn't stay as it is. It will, it will vibrate. It will try to get rid of this energy somehow, of this heat. This is called ring puckering. You see it's distorted. The other one is it's really open. 
and you can calculate and, and you know there are these kind of different energy pathways and you see with light you excite it and then the question is does it go left does it go right and then there are for example instances here that are being discussed a lot in chemistry they are called conical intersections why is it important okay when you go to the beach here in summer we should all get skin cancer all the time some people do but we should get it all the time because there is UV in the sunlight. Right? That's why you use sunscreen. But the UV means that you actually split some molecules apart. Because the UV means more energy, high energy. So if you just think about it, we should get skin cancer all the time. Why don't we get this? Well, because there are these magical pathways. For example, it connects red and pink here. And instead of being staying excited, there is a quick way for the excitation, for the energy that you put in through the sunlight to go into heat. Right? So that's why you heat up, actually, when you absorb UV light in your skin. But you don't get skin cancer. So it's a very important question that is not completely clear and solved, for example, in biology. And, but it's the same thing. You find this many times in chemistry. It's one of the fundamental processes where you want to understand which way does it go. And it doesn't go just one or the other way. It might be actually a distribution. So we, we looked at this with, the, with our auto second x-rays and we can actually time resolve, like in a movie, we are able to follow the excitation completely and even know at which time happens what. Where am I? At which pathway? For example, this is the molecule when it's intact. And there is one peak here because these are actually two peaks that are overlapping because when the molecule is intact, there are just two different atoms in here. You see this is symmetric, right? One is closer to the oxygen, one is farther away. The same here. I cannot distinguish left and right, but the two are different. So this gives two peaks in that. Just believe me on this. When the molecule is open, you see, it's a drastic change. And we can exactly say when it happens. So we see immediately there are four peaks. Why four peaks? Because when the molecule breaks open, you see the distance from the red one is different for each of them. So this shifts them a little bit in energy. And that's without explaining everything. Ask me if you want afterwards. But it's a direct signature of what we call symmetry breaking in that. And we can time it. In this case, it's. It's not totally slow, right? It's like about 60 femtoseconds or so. It's really fast. We can go even further. So what I show you here is this probability density, where the electron is on that molecule, on that, on that ring. And we can even, from the oscillations, you see this is on any time scale here. We can zoom in as much as we want, until 23 attoseconds, if you want. We can even see where the charge is and how it moves around and it oscillates around. And we can now film this for the first time. We can see this really. And seeing is, of course, the first step, in my opinion, to understanding or trying to control it even. So this is very exciting because with other methods, you will have no chance to see this. And this we saw for the very first time. We just are publishing this. And we also. With many methods, this is what we say dark. You don't see it. You're not sensitive to it. But with the X-ray methods, you are. I give you one last example. Because, for example, going to this energy problems, or there is one field which is called Valleytronics. Uh, this is about basically trying to encode information, right? You want to store information, and you want to encode 0 or 1 like in a hard disk, right, to store your information. The problem is it should stay long enough and it should not lose a lot of energy. So in material science, some people work on something called valley polarization. And you see, for example, 2D materials, right, atomic layers of materials. And the, one, of the, one of the goals would be that you can encode 0 or 1 with optical light with optical light and by just changing, for example, the handedness of the light from left to right, you say it's zero or it's one or one zero. That, has, that would be one thing that you can control it with light because it couples differently to the, to the charges in the material. And the other one is that you can switch the light very quickly. Right? Typical electronics is on a frequency scale, let's say, of gigahertz, right? so mega to gigahertz. 
Um, so 10 to the 6, right, 10 to the 9, like million, billion, and light works on a petahertz scale, 10 to the 15, very different. So maybe we don't get to 10 to the 15, but if you could make electronics a thousand times faster, that's just half of it, this would already be a very big breakthrough. Of course, there are lots of questions to be solved, right? You don't want big lasers, you want little devices and so on, but this is fundamental research on these, on these prospects. So if you look at the material, I don't know if you can see this, like in graphene, which is a hot topic and you have probably seen a lot, they always, people always draw this hexagon, which is basically the unit cell or it's like the atomic uh, arrangement, if you will. And you see maybe there are some dots here, three dots. This is where the excitation is. If I have such a field and if I align it in a certain way, I can only excite, let's say, these three. And if you look in this case, the material, the, it consists of two atoms, molybdenum and sulfur. So I can address just one of the atoms, if you will. I'm simplifying a little. And if I rotate it, you see here, this has inverted. I don't know if you can see this, right? If you look here, there is an excitation on the bottom and the top two, and here the other way around. And the only thing we have done is rotated this weird field. It looks like a propeller, in fact. Right, which connects these three, you see we have just inverted it. Just by a little rotation of the optical field. And we have shown that this works. Now, I said Atto is also quantum. Well, these are really quantum dynamic properties, right? We'll, it's really light matter interaction on the fundamental level, on the most fundamental level. And so the question comes up naturally, what are the quantum properties of the light, right? It must be non-classical to some extent. And you know there is a, especially also here, there is a lot of efforts on, I would say, quantum communication, computing. I will not get into advantages and disadvantages. But one of the issues is, of course, that you want these entangled photons, so these correlated photons that talk to each other, that are connected to each other, but you don't want two photons. You need many photons to, to use these properties, to send them through fibers, to, to use them in devices, and that's one of the challenges. And potentially, and there are first experiments here that we're also involved in, this kind of interaction that we're using to make other second pulses is probably strongly entangled. So currently, we're trying to understand how to, how to understand it, how to measure it, how to tease that out. But it's a, a very exciting new area which is emerging in the Atto second field, which could be strong field quantum optics. And it will be interesting to see whether <coughs> this is a way to learn about the materials or to use the materials, in fact, to control the light and to control the quantum properties of the light, which would be very exciting. So where are these Atto second light sources available? Well, they're available in Castel FS at ICFO, for example. Uh, but they're also in other places, and they're, they're even others. Not everybody makes single attosecond pulses. Not everybody makes them at, you know, for material science in these soft x-rays. So I mentioned many uh, colleagues here as well. But this is typically how it looks like if you want to visit me, and you're welcome. There are other uh, ways to, well, people try to make this. They are not quite there yet in terms of the short pulse duration, the stability, and so on. That's a way that is pursued, and you see on a huge scale. It's very expensive. So one of them is, for example, in Hamburg. Uh, this is here, the Exfel, the European Exfel. <coughs> the other one is in Stanford, the linear accelerator, which is which is just have become online. The third one is in Korea. There's also one in Trieste. And they, I mean, this is something that the community invests a lot in. But you see, I'm not saying that we can do the same, but we can do a lot on a much smaller laboratory scale, which I think is exciting because you want to have, for people to have this kind of capabilities, right? That material scientists, chemists, you know, can, can use this or even company. So what are possible outlooks? What can be done with it? I think there are many possibilities. I show you some of them. And it's a very interdisciplinary field. So what I try to tell you is, auto second science, it might sound weird, but the, the complication or the difficulty or the joy for me is that it crosses many different fields. Lasers, nonlinear optics, ultra-high vacuum, 
um, you know, condensed metal physics to some extent, chemistry and so on. And of course, you need to bring this together to do something in that field, but it means it connects these fields also. And I think this is, this is the real power of, of that field. It's not just a short pulse that you can make and maybe you hold a world record. It's really the application of what you can try uh, to look into. And what I show you here, so thanks for listening, is uh, my group, the current group. This is in Benasque on some retreat. Uh, the names are up there, and um, some colleagues that I collaborate with in blue also um, in Spain, but actually a lot here in, in Catalonia also on material science, on superconductivity and different things, and a lot of different collaborators over the years from different places actually to, to work on these different aspects of the development during the last basically 16, 17 years. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope it was a little interesting for you. Actually, I will uh, ask something. In the very last uh, slide, you commented, yes, the high DC superconductor. Yes. What, what, uh, what kind of investigation could uh, people make on this problem, high DC superconductor? Yeah, okay. So, as, as you probably know, um, I think I clicked again one too many times. Let's see. No, okay. So, I have to be careful how I say it, but um, for example, if you look at ITC superconductivity, the microscopic origins are not really understood. Okay? And if you look, for example, the, depending on the theory, you can explain it with attractive potentials, you can explain the same with repulsive potentials, there's a lot of debate on it. And one of the difficulties is, of course, to measure them in, it's not just superconducting or non-superconducting, as you might know, the materials have many different quantum phases. For example, strange metal phase, you know, yeah. partial, and so on. And so what we have, for example, started doing some years ago is first to see whether this strong field interaction, normally you think, okay, so how do you think about classical superconductivity is that you have, let's say, two electrons that pair they are spin entangled, let's say, they're because of some lattice motion or something. And now they are like uh, neutral, they are like a boson. But the different bosons are not entangled with each other. So can I study this with strong fields or will I destroy it? And we showed, in fact, that you can optically detect all the different quantum phases that the material has without destroying it. Number one. So that means I can think of doing an investigation into its origins. Number one. We can even get the whole doping out of such a measure. What we're currently trying to gear up with, for example, with Anna Palaos, this is at, at, at uh, ICMA, is one of the questions is, I, maybe you remember, I said a lot of things, I know I, I, I loaded a lot of stuff on you, but with the X-ray method that we have, we can look at electronic and nuclear or lattice motion at the same time, and we can disentangle through the methods we have developed what is the contribution from the lattice and what is the contribution from the, from the charges. So what we are trying to do is apply that to superconductors or mod materials, correlated materials, and look at the phase transition what happens. Right? This has never been done, it was never possible, and it will be interesting to see, is it that simple as people think? Is it more complicated? I think it's more complicated. Right? If you believe in thermodynamic, at a phase transition there is an increase in, uh, in uh, entropy. Mm -hmm. So we have to see, for example, are there fluctuations? Can we measure this? And I believe we can measure this. So we want to apply it to this to see if we can give a new perspective. Because, as you might know, um, there are claims on high temperature superconductivity uh, induced by light, you know, by lattice motion. If you, if you pump the lattice with terahertz radiation, <laughs> Andrea Cavalieri is doing that in Hamburg, then there seems to be a transport like superconductivity. Or well, I'll give you another example. Uh, currently hot topic is this, it's called twistronics, right? I don't know if, if, if you know about it. It's basically you have layers of graphene or different 2D materials and 
if you if you bring let's say one layer together with another, you change the electronics properties or structure. And if you twist it even, yeah. you can make these bands flat. And then people always say, oh, it's like superconducting. But you don't really see Meissner effect. You see some, something in the transport. So it will be interesting uh, to see if we can really look at electronic motion because we can measure, I didn't show you, but we can measure actually electron motion, we can measure electron scattering, we can determine which scattering mechanisms it is. Is it Auger heating? Is it is it, multiple, is, it um, is it multiple scatterings? What are the time scales? When does the lattice uh, couple into it? So this is where I'm interested in. I think it's important to apply this machinery to these questions. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Long answer, but um, anyways. I have a question. Well, um, let's see. How do I ask? For example, when you say that you look at a molecule or you look at a vibration, let's take the case of the closed and open molecule, for example, that you presented. What you really measure and how the broad spectra affects in this case? It is, a, it is an advantage or it is a drawback? It's an advantage. In fact, so the, okay, I didn't show this because I was trying to focus on something that is not, not too detailed. But, okay, as you know, the, a short pulse is supported by a broad spectrum. The shorter the pulse, the broader the spectrum. And typically, if you want to do time-resolved measurements and you want to have a really short pulse, it's a problem for spectroscopy because you seem to lose spectral resolution. This is not the case on the other second x-rays because you decouple the time resolution of the x-rays with the spectral resolution on the measurement, on the spectrometer. You disperse the spectrum. So for example, I don't know, do, do, okay, this gets too didactical maybe. <laughs> but, um, so, so let's say if you look at, um, let's say you have a carbon atom, okay? And you say you have 1s, 2s, 2p, that's, that's basically the electronic structure of, a, of a hypothetical carbon atom, right? And so <coughs> carbon, carbon has six, atom, uh, six electrons. <coughs> so that means this one is paired, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, let's say, okay? That's what you see in chemistry class. So now... Um, if I have another carbon atom here in the vicinity, what does this do? This interacts through Coulomb force, through electrostatic force. That means it shifts these levels a bit. And I can detect it. Okay, I, I measure this. So if I have a molecule, they're automatically shifted. Now, let's say I do, I do some spectroscopy. Or you say, in this case, the ring opens. Let's say this carbon atom, right, breaks up. Okay? What, if this breaks up, right, it's gone, that means there is a shift here. If I can detect it, I know it broke up. So what I do in my spectrum, okay, in this case, it's a very simple case, right? I showed you, I showed you earlier, let's go back to this uh, huge spectrum here, okay? I show you the huge spectrum. So what I'm talking about is just this tiny range. Now, if I have lattice motion, if this is just vibrating, this is shifting all the time, okay? Now the problem is when I look here and I excite something, I also change this occupation. So both is mingled together. It's difficult to disentangle this. But I have also the spectrum, this is wrong, this should be up here. I have other states that are not occupied. They do exist and each, each, each element in the periodic table has its own structure. It's like a fingerprint. This is what X-ray spectroscopy is based on. So if you have something unknown, you go to Alba, you say, please look at this. They measure that and they can tell you so much of carbon, so much of nitrogen, whatever, right? So that means if I have a spectrum that covers all of this, right? These levels also shift. There is nothing there, but they shift. What does X-ray spectroscopy mean? X-ray spectroscopy means I steal one of these ones and I put it where it can go, right, up here. This is what I measure in my spectrum. 
So these changes in energy is actually measuring that spectrum. And if you go to a synchrotron, they make it very narrow band and they scan, right? Very slowly, it takes an hour or two. So you have no time resolution. We measure it at once, everything. So that means if something vibrates, I don't look here, I look here. If I want to see where the electrons go, I look where they are. And of course, all the information is redundant, if you will. So by measuring this broad spectrum, honest, so I will say something even more provocative. The real power of utter second science is not the pulse duration, <laughs> my whole talk. <laughs> yeah, in, the in, real power of utter second science is the coherent spectrum in a short pulse. But for most of the investigations, you don't need a 20 utter second pulse. What you want is to see all of this at once together. And this is the way to disentangle the superconductivity, maybe. I'm not saying that we, we will succeed, but it's a new way to look at this that didn't exist until now. For, for this, this uh, yeah, yeah, for this kind of application, obviously the, the broad spectra it's an advantage, but I mean there are other kind of application of these ultra short pulses where it's a drawback, like for example, nonlinear optics, for example, if you want to use them to to do any kind of nonlinear interaction, we know that these nonlinear interactions are very sensitive and depends strongly on the wavelength, mm -hmm. so you need short pulses, but they come with the ultra broad spectra, so mm -hmm. I suppose there are other applications where, where the broad spectra is a drawback. So, yeah, I, I can tell you many, and this is why I picked X-ray spectroscopy. For example, a lot of it is done in electron spectroscopy. If I would measure, so in electron spectroscopy, you, you put, let's say this is your carbon atom, you put high energy radiation in here, you kick out the electrons and you measure them directly. If you have such a broad spectrum, you have no idea where they come from. This is the wrong application, in my opinion. Right? That's one wrong one. If you want to do nonlinear optics with this, so first of all, I have two comments. One comment is that the, probably one of the most sensitive spectroscopy is linear spectroscopy. It's not boring. It's, it's important to do linear spectroscopy, number one. And another important thing is these x -ray, soft X-ray pulses, they are very weak. That can be a problem if you want to do nonlinear optics, but it's an advantage if I want to probe something because I don't want them to influence what I probe, right? So this is why I'm saying I think it's a really powerful analytic technique. I can give you another comment. I just don't want to bore everybody else with it. But if you want to do nonlinear optics, for example, in atomic ionization, you shouldn't use a laser. You should use, in fact, a stochastic light source. Because the higher the nonlinearity, it's more probable that three photons arrive at the same time in the same space if you have a random light source than from a laser. This has been shown, in fact. <laughs> so you shouldn't use an x fel that costs a billion euros <laughs> sure. to do nonlinear ionization. But that's what's being done. <laughs> OK, I will, I will get killed for saying that. But, uh, Thank you very much for your very pedagogical <laughs> conference. You must be very tired. Eh? <laughs> I, I think, I think, I hope I'm, you're less tired than me. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, a silly question, just no, for a question. No silly question. Uh, are there uh, molecular, molecular reactions faster than ATO that cannot be followed by this time escape? So we don't know of, so <laughs> if you look at the fastest time scale, there is no, um, mo there is no molecular reaction that is that fast, none. The, so the fast, if you look at the motion of an electron around the nucleus is about 150 attoseconds. So it's already, uh, yeah, it's fast enough. If you want to find something that is faster, it's nuclear reactions. Okay, but then you don't need soft X-rays; you need gamma rays. And people are, of, of course, fantasizing about it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So I, I have more. It was not a silly question. <laughs> Thank you. I have two silly questions, but they're mostly theory. So, from a, uh, <clears throat> what do you need to generate this, these 
individual peaks that you then, you know, all these harmonics. So do you need a, a multi-level atom, for example? You need multi-levels that generate these peaks and then combine together in that way? Okay, so first of all, the medium where you generate it can be anything. Rina knows this, or uh, Jose, that, or you. If you drive things hard enough, everything is nonlinear. So, okay, you use, you use typically noble gases because they're easy to handle. At, at what we do, the problem is we need to use helium, the one with the highest ionization potential. And helium is expensive because we have an um, artificial helium crisis. These are easy to handle things, but we can make harmonics from solids just not to the hard x-ray or soft x-ray yet, because you need to drive them harder and you would damage them. You can make it from liquids even. It's an in-between regime. But the best sources currently are, for, the, for these photon energies, are just gas, helium. For much lower photon energies, to learn about this, this is this um, valetronic stuff I was talking about. We do this in solids. Um, yeah. So, but, but do you need uh, so then, states, many states? So uh, then you need, you can do it different. If you want a, a comb, these harmonics, as you asked, the easiest is to have a long laser pulse, many oscillations of the laser field, right? So your laser pulse, let's say 30 femtoseconds at 800 nanometer, your standard tie stuff you can buy. One oscillation is 2.5 femtoseconds. So you have, let's say, 15, 12, 13, really, right under the envelope. So if you do this, you will get a nice comb of harmonics. That's, okay. that's the easiest, to make, to make a comb. Okay, so now I'm, I'll think about that. The other question is, as you know, Luis Rosso is interested in, uh, in investigate the vacuum, to probe the vacuum, but he's thinking about high peak power densities. Mm -hmm. The question is whether you could use time to kind of do the same thing. In other words, to image the vacuum. How short would you, would you have to go to be able to do that? Or, or is it even conceivable? This is a very good theory question. <laughs> so, okay, so for example, at Eli in Romania, as you might, so this is an infrastructure, um, European light infrastructure in Romania. It's about nuclear physics. And the dream is that you have two 10 petawatt lasers. This is basically, uh, it's probably the whole institute with the whole ground floor is one laser that cost, I think, 60 million euros. And it's two times 10 petawatt and you collide them. And the hope is that you actually boil electron positron pairs out of vacuum. So the first problem is, how do you know it was vacuum? If you just have one atom in there, you will never detect this with your vacuum measurement gauge. Okay, let's forget that this is an issue. Even if you go into, the, into, the, into outer space, outer space is not that empty, right? We think it's empty, but it's not that empty, even if you go far away from Earth. So there, there are experimental problems on that. And of course, um, nearly all of the theory that I know assumes plane waves. You never have a plane wave when you focus a laser. They don't, it's, it's not really taking into account the temporal structure. Most pulses are chirped. They're never, as we show them in a textbook, very nicely behaved. Even if you say this is not an issue, you know, like in the National Ignition Facility, for example, also theory was wrong. Or, and then experiment could show, yes, I mean, theory is not because theory was wrong, it's just difficult, right? <laughs> and the point was they achieved it which is what you heard maybe last year or the year before on you know, some return on fusion. And I think it's, it's similar there. I think it's, um, as an academic exercise, I think it's interesting because it, it, you know, it advances our knowledge. Is it practical? I mean, it's a huge effort for that. And I, I think a lot has to, has to happen to really detect that. So I'm, I wouldn't put my PhD on it. Yes, yet. But you know, we came a long way with lasers, right? I mean, the fact that we can make these pulses 10 years ago, it, I mean, this was by accident discovered. And what I tried to show you is my excitement about applying it to some real investigations. And I hope a little bit stays with you at least, you know, even if it's a lot of details and so on. But I wanted to give you a bit of the feeling of the complexity and what can be done with it. So I don't know if I really answer it, but um, I, 
yes, it's, it's an interesting ideal, but you know there are synchrotron experiments that have already uh, published some pair generation. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving too long answers, yes, sorry. Fast. How, um, how fast they temporarily broaden these, these pulses when you are generating? I mean, they are highly chirped or they are... You, you mean the other second pulse? Yeah. Well, you cannot go through anything, right? I mean, the material, when you... So you generate them, then they propagate in vacuum, mm -hmm. in rough vacuum, that's good enough. And of course, if they interact with the material, they will chirp. And you can actually measure this. And this, it's, it's actually not that bad because the frequency is different. Mm -hmm. right? It depends, as you know, it depends where uh, you have the singularities or where the dispersion, right? The, the curve basically diverges. And it's not anywhere there. You're far away from the nuclear transitions and you're not in the UV with the optical transitions. If you would make this with VUV or XUV, it's a different story. Let's see online. I don't see. Okay. No, there are no no. questions online. Okay. Maybe I killed all the questions. Sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much. One, one please. Um, well, firstly, of course, thank you for uh, all the presentation. Um, as you can probably guess, I'm quite young. Uh, I haven't even started. Good for you. <laughs> I haven't even started the the career yet. Uh, I haven't studied um, yes. physics, um, even at an undergraduate level, so mm -hmm. uh, profiting from the fact it's the last question and I don't think I'm going to waste much time. Um, you're, you're I would highly time. appreciate if I could get some career advice from someone like you. Okay. Um, career advice. <laughs> I will probably tell you something that um, is obvious and is sometimes difficult to follow. Try to f look. Nowadays, we are all professors, and in our institutions, we do a lot that we offer to students, a lot of courses. And sometimes, compared to me, I mean, we worked very hard, but we had more time to find out what we really like. You know? And the most important, I think, in life is that you try to, you know, things happen. Things will be complicated with people, with whatever. If you find something that you're passionate about, and I'm still passionate about it, you know, after many years, then that means you will succeed against problems that occur in life, always. And they do occur. And that means if you, if you, if you like something, you will be good at it. Maybe not all the time, but sometimes. And it doesn't matter whether you do physics or you sell socks on the Ramblas or something like this, but I think this is the most important thing. And not to lose the perspective on that. I'm not saying this is always easy, but imagine you finish your degree in some way. You take all these courses, you take a job, and you don't like it at all. This is frustrating. This is difficult. You will not succeed with it. So try, try to find something that excites you, that, that you, and try a few different things. Also, if you're from here, leave your country for a few years. See how things work. It's good to see your own country from the outside. It doesn't mean something's wrong, but I, try it a little bit. And if you're an undergrad or a master's student, you know we're always pressured to do things quickly and better, and you need to be the first and so on. But it's important to, to find this out. I think this is, this is the advice I would give you. I don't know if there are many professors here. I, I don't know if you would agree, but probably yes. Thank you very much. It doesn't much. matter what it is, but you should like it. So thank you very much. Thank you.